morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Uh, for our in-house guests, we have that one last reminder for a courtesy to see that our mobile devices have been silenced. And for those watching online, you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And of course, we will post today's program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference as well. Leading dis our discussion today is my good colleague, Norbert Michel. Mr. Michel serves as director of our Center for Data Analysis. Please join in welcoming him. Norbert. I mean, today uh, we have a distinguished panel, and we will, uh, after our panel discussion, we will open up to audience Q&A for a little while, so we'll get going. I'm going to do the introductions to my immediate left, which is very rare. Uh, Alex Pollack is a distinguished senior fellow with the R Street Institute, uh, where he provides thought leadership on financial issues broadly defined. Um, financials, uh, these include fin understanding financial systems, cycles of booms and busts, financial crises, risk and uncertainty, central banking, and the politics of finance. Uh, Alex, uh, Alex joined R Street in 2016 after quite a while at uh, American Enterprise Institute, which is when I met Alex. Uh, previously, he was president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago from 1991 to 2004. He also serves as director of the CME Group. As a director of the Great Lakes Higher Education Corp, a director and past chairman of the Great Books Foundation. Uh, he has been, he's also past president of the International Union for Housing Finance and a member of the advisory board of the Heller College of Business at Roosevelt University. Uh, Alex received his bachelor's from Williams College, his master's in philosophy from the University of Chicago, and a master's in public administration in international affairs from Princeton. And then to his left, we have Thomas Hogan. He is a fellow in the Baker Institute at Rice University. He was formerly chief economist, the US Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. And though a whole bunch of us tried to get him to stay in Washington, he wanted to leave. But he could come back for things like this, so. <laughs> his, his primary research interests uh, include, uh, include banking regulation and monetary theory. And Dr. Hogan was previously assistant professor of finance at Troy and assistant professor of economics at West Texas A&M University. He has worked for Merrill Lynch's Commodity Trading Group and for investment firms in the U.S. and Europe. He served as a research fellow at Cato Institute and the American Institute for Economic Research, was a consultant to the World Bank. He earned his PhD in economics from George Mason and holds his bachelor's and master's in business administration from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, his work has been published in many academic journals, uh, such as Economic Inquiry, Journal of Regulatory Economics, and the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking. And then last but not least, we have Diego Zuluaga, who is a policy analyst at Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives where he covers financial technology and consumer credit, as well as other financial areas. Uh, before joining Cato, Diego was head of financial services and tech policy at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. While at IEA, he authored papers on the social value of finance, the regulation of online platforms, and the taxation of capital income, among other, among other issues. His work has been featured in print and broadcast media such as Times, Newsweek, and the Daily Telegraph. He's a prolific public speaker as well as a former lecturer in economics at the University of Buckingham. Uh, he's originally from northern Spain, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the town's name because I can't do it. I last hold, name right, so. Is it, yeah, I got, the, <laughs> I got the last name, so. <laughs> uh, Diego holds a BA in economics and history from McGill University and an MSc in financial economics from the University of Oxford, and that's all of us. Uh, I'm going to just start off with a brief overview of the rule. Uh, there's a lot of detail in there, I'm sorry, the rule proposal. There's a lot of detail in there that I'm not going to cover because it would take too long, but I think I can give you a really quick synopsis uh, of, of what's in there. That's what I'm going to do, and then we'll just go down the line for our panelists to comment. Uh, but I'm just, I'm gonna to try to reserve most of my commentary and just sort of tell you what would it do. Broadly speaking, 
uh, this proposal is seeking to integrate uh, three things. The Fed's capital rule, its comprehensive capital analysis and review rule, or CCAR, and its stress test rules. Now, to accomplish that task is going to have to amend several different rules. Uh, one is the capital plan rule, which the CCAR implements. The other is just the capital rule. Uh, one is the stress testing rules. One set is the stress testing rules. And then they also have to amend their official stress test stress testing policy statement. Uh, and all of that combined is why I can only give you an overview. Uh, in practice, one of the biggest changes that this process is going to make is that it's going to, if, if it's implemented, is that it would, re it would replace the static 2.5% risk-weighted asset portion of what's known as the capital conservation buffer. That's, that's current law under the capital rule. There's just a flat 2.5% of risk weight capital conservation buffer. And it's going to replace that with, with what's called the stress capital buffer. And the idea is to use the stress testing process to tailor this amount for the holding company. Uh, so it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all flat, flat rate. It's going to be tailored to the specific company. And the difference would basically be between the firm's starting uh, and lowest projected tier one capital ratio under a severely adverse scenario of the stress test, plus any amount of dividends. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then this is in addition to any global systemically important bank, GSIB, surcharge. So it doesn't replace that stuff. Um, at an even more granular, granular level, um, the board right now, under current law, can object to the capital plan, the firm's capital plan, if the firm fails to demonstrate its ability to, main these, to maintain capital ratios above the minimum requirements on a post-stress basis. So what the proposal will do is replace that framework, that objection, with something called a stress leverage buffer. And again, the idea is to use the stress tests to tailor this requirement to the individual firms. Uh, so uh, basically, this is, I'm going to stop. <laughs> uh, a firm would be required to maintain capital ratios above its minimum plus these buffer requirements uh, in order to avoid restrictions on capital distributions like dividend payments or share repurchases and even discretionary bonus payments. So you have your minimum capital ratios and then you have a buffer that goes above that, two separate buffers. And it's not going to be a flat buffer. It's going to be a tailored, firm-specific, based on the stress test type of buffers, set of buffers, set of buffers. We'll call it a set of buffers. Um, now, I'm going to read this because this is as close as I'm going to get to my commentary. Uh, this is taken directly out of the summary. Uh, after this simplification, because this is supposed to simplify things, believe it or not, uh, the, the firms will go from having to deal with about 24 requirements to 12, I believe, and that's getting in the weeds, but after the simplification, a firm would be bound by the most stringent distribution limitations, if any, as determined by, one, the firm's standardized approach capital conservation buffer requirement, two, the firm's stress leverage buffer requirement, and if applicable, three, the firm's advanced approaches capital conservation buffer requirement, and four, the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio standard. That's it. <laughs> uh, which firms, and that's kind of the end of, of my thing here, um, which firms will this apply to? It will apply to bank holding companies with 50 billion or more in total assets, as well as the U.S. intermediate holding companies of foreign banks established under the enhanced prudential standards, which is regulation YY. So this does not apply to all small, to any small banks, really. Uh, and importantly, this is something that I think gets lost a lot up here in Washington. Um, this really doesn't apply to banks, as you were thinking of banks. This applies to the bank holding companies. This is all about the new resolution process for a failed bank. And the way this is designed is to have more capital up at the top holding company level so that if one of the subsidiaries on the, on the bottom does fail, like an insured depository institution, what we would all think of as our bank, 
that they can send some of that capital downstream. So instead of just saying there's gonna be one amount that you have to keep up there, we're gonna be doing all these things. Not gonna be doing 24 things anymore, maybe be doing about 12 things, plus a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but that's, that's the idea, that's what this is about. Um, and the stated reasons are, and then I, w I really will shut up, the stated reasons are relative to, or are related to what happened in the, in the last, in the 2008 crisis. In the 2008 crisis, there was a lot of TARP money going out the door, and about half of that money uh, actually, you could say, was effectively paid out in dividend distributions by the bank holding companies. That caused a problem, that caused it to look bad, and this, all of this, this framework that we have now um, is in response to that. Basically saying, no, if we're giving you money, you can't pay dividends, but in this case, it's even more stringent than that. It's if we think you're going to be surviving, or, or not surviving, but if we think you're going to be in a stressed event, we're going to stop you from paying dividends, other than what we have in this specific plan under these specific guidelines. Very simple. <laughs> That's the proposal to uh, align all these different things and to streamline some of these things. And if we have time at the end of this, I'll come back and make a couple of comments. But otherwise, I'm going to go over to our panel and we'll start with Alex. Thanks very much, Norbert. And it is great to be here. Uh, the greatest writer on banking, Walter Badgett, said the most pertinent and striking fact about banks is the smallness of the capital. So I remind us, this whole discussion is actually about the fact that we're dealing in a, in a regime relative to virtually anybody else in the world of smallness of capital. And it's just how small is small, even though we talk about it as how big is big. Now, I think you, you can have some sympathy for the Fed in this. Uh, the Fed, as I think about it, is the equivalent of a BP spire in a complex security known as a bank. And it's trying to figure out how much subordination it needs underneath it to protect the position of its, uh, of its commitment to go in and uh, supply money uh, if, as, and when, and when needed. But nonetheless, as Norbert has pointed out, the, the response is one of extreme uh, complexity. Uh, and as Paul Kupiak of AEI, whose place I have the honor to take uh, today, has said, this complexity is also accompanied by opaqueness uh, of the rules and especially in a stress testing environment, the Fed is basically able to put into the stress test anything it wants uh, and to regulate by means of stress test without notice and comment, just by putting stuff into this very opaque and, and complex stress test. Well, com complexity obviously meets your eye in all of this. Uh, Professor Richard Herring of the Wharton uh, School uh, writes in a current article that he, he traces the growing complexity of capital regulation. The pattern is one, he says, of increasingly complex regulations as each round of reform attempts to correct perceived weaknesses in earlier regimes. The outcome is a regulatory frame, framework that's remarkably opaque, costly to monitor and to enforce with heavy compliance costs on the regulatees which are inevitably passed on to users of financial services. Herring counts not 24, but 39 different regulatory capital requirements in his paper. Uh, whatever the number is, it's, it's a lot. Uh, the Fed itself, in its proposal, uh, says this about one particularly complex uh, area, which is so-called advanced uh, risk-based capital approaches, which they they want the banks to use, but but not in the not done by the regulator. Uh, to date, says the Fed, the board has not used or required the use of the capital rules advanced approaches in the supervisory stress test due to the significant resources required to implement the advanced approaches on a pro forma basis. To the complexity and opaqueness, the Fed itself says the complexity and opaqueness associated with introducing the advanced approaches in supervisory stress tests. Uh, in addition, both the supervisory stress test and advance, advanced approaches are calibrated to reflect tail risks and thus could be duplicative to require a firm to meet the requirements of both advanced and, uh, approaches as well as others. Um, 
I'd just say when they say advanced approaches are calibrated to reflect tail risks, we might more accurately say try to reflect tail risks since it's the tail risk uh, which we don't really and can't uh, know. Well, what about all this complexity? Pollock's seventh law states in any extremely complex situation, you never know what you're really doing. And I think this applies to this regulation itself. You can't really know because of the, intera the complexity interacts with itself and the various tests interact with each other and the behavior introduced by uh, into the firms interact with other firms and with the government. And it's very hard to know how that all turns out. A great example from the last crisis is the interaction of the banking system and the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie and Freddie, where the regulation of the banks interacted with the regulation of the GSEs. The GSEs were themselves leveraged 60 to 1, the double leverage was introduced by letting the banks buy on a super leveraged basis the equity of GSEs, which resulted in a total system which was hyper leveraged uh, to mortgage risk, which really wasn't very well understood, I think, how that interaction took place with uh, obviously disastrous uh, uh, results. Uh, capital regulations and stress tests also are a kind of credit allocation by the government, since the things which are favored uh, in, the, in risk weights or in stress tests uh, tend to induce capital flows. And as Herring points out, in the original Basel, going back 30 years, uh, two of the, two of the uh, goals were to incentivize uh, banks to hold more liquid assets. Liquid assets basically means government liabilities, so we, don't, we know that governments always wish banks to hold more government liabilities, including the liabilities of government-sponsored uh, enterprises of various kinds, and also, Herring points out, to favor mortgage lending. And these and other things like this get built into uh, any complex system, a kind of allocation problem. Well, can you actually simplify uh, all these sorts of things? Well, one attempt at simplification, which didn't work, was mark to market. Really, there were a lot of academics uh, 20 years ago, many friends of mine, who said, this is very simple. You just mark to market, and then you have prompt corrective action, and there will never be a problem. <laughs> well, it obviously didn't work. Uh, it, was an, you know, it was an interesting idea. Uh, we know that mark to market is a disaster when applied in a crisis. And in fact, the stress tests introduced by the Fed and the Treasury under Tim Geithner were a brilliant way to get out of mark to market. If you think of how it actually worked, the stress tests were introduced so they could forget about mark to market in the crisis. And that was actually a smart thing to do. So mark to market isn't the, uh, isn't the answer, certainly in a crisis. And the other simplification, of course, is just to have a lot of capital. Instead of smallness of capital, we have bigness of capital. Uh, we have the uh, once widely discussed proposal of Ahmadi and Helvig. Well, just have 20 to 30 percent leveraged capital. Uh, a letter of many experts, including uh, Charles Goodhart, said, well, 15 percent would do, just 15 percent. The Choice Act, I think not unreasonably, said, we'll give you a choice. You can have all of this complexity and stress tests in Basel, or you can have 10 percent capital. Uh, my own proposal would be 10 percent is pretty good but you should also have some kind of a simple liquidity requirement, like 25% of assets, and a real estate limit. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the commercial banking system of this country and other countries uh, uh, has become a real estate banking system. So we used to be, the Bank Holding Company Act used to define a bank as an entity that made commercial loans and took demand deposits. The correct definition now is an entity which, by and large, makes real estate loans, by the way, invests in real estate securities as well, uh, and issues government-sponsored guarantees. Uh, or, I'm sorry, issues government-guaranteed uh, liabilities. Now, uh, on top of this, and a final uh, point just to make as I conclude, is we're trying to understand how all of this works throughout a cycle. As the Fed's proposal says, the impact of the proposal will vary throughout the economic cycle. This is surely right, and the, the 
problem that regulation often turns out to be pro-cyclical instead of counter-cyclical uh, is one worthy uh, of uh, continuing uh, thought and analysis. Uh, finally, I would say in all of these things, what we really ought to be asking ourselves is what amount of capital would be required in a truly free market banking system, one that isn't shot through with government guarantees and government directions to make loans to favored constituencies, what capital would a market demand? That's uh, worth figuring out. Thanks, Norbert. Thank you, Alex. And now we have Thomas Hogan. Thank you, Norbert, and thank you, Alex, for your comments. And Thank you, everyone, for coming today. I'm glad we're all interested in the super exciting topic of bank capital regulation. Um, well, maybe not that exciting, but I, I think we would all agree very important. And so I wish more people were interested in talking about it. Um, I'm going to talk today about the proposals that, that Norbert discussed in the uh, context of, of regulatory complexity. So both Alex and Norbert talked about complexity. I want to I want to talk a little bit more about why that's a problem and what it means for the current proposals. Uh, my comments today are going to be based on a, a policy paper that I, I hope a lot of you got here um, that is recently published by the Baker Institute. Uh, the title is Strong Simple Regulations Promote Financial Stability. And so I think a lot of the people here have a copy. If you're watching online, you can download it from the Baker Institute website. And the um, Academic studies that I'm going to cite and some quotations that I'll give are, are cited in that paper. So if any of you want to be able to look up the citations and share them with other people, um, you can get them in the paper. And I think the quotations that I'm going to give are kind of bipartisan. You know, I tried to find people that were Republicans and Democrats because I think this is really kind of a you know, nonpartisan issue. This, these proposals are just a case where we've got some regulations and we want to make them better. And I think you know everyone wants that, and so it's not really a, a partisan thing. Um, but th these changes that we're talking about, they're not that big. You know, the, the proposals that have been going around in the past few years, a lot of things that were supposed to be giant changes to the regulatory system and repeal Dodd Frank. Um, these proposals are not anything like that. They're kind of fine tuning of the capital regulations, but they still provide an important idea about. What are the new regulators thinking? You know, we've had turnover at the Federal Reserve, and the, the new administration there um, may have a different direction. And these regulations, I think, give us an indication of what they're thinking. And so I think these changes are, are pretty important. So like I said, I, I want to talk about this in terms of um, regulatory complexity, because a lot of people just think more regulation is better. If we have more regulations, then we're going to have a more stable uh, financial system. And that's just not true because of the problem of complexity, as, as Alex and Norbert discussed. So I, I think of complexity as being a problem because it can actually push banks to take more risk. So we don't just want more regulations because they might be encouraging risk in the financial system. So I think of that as happening in kind of three ways. The most simple way is that complexity creates loopholes. We can think of it like the tax code. We might all agree that a simple tax code would be better, but we might want to allow some deductions for if you have a new family, if you're buying a home, something like that. But once we get a lot of deductions, we might be in a situation where people with really high incomes can avoid a large part of their tax burden and kind of get out of some of those uh, regulations. And the same thing is true of banking regulations. We have complexity. It allows the banks to sort of get around the, the regulations and take more risk than they normally would. Uh, the second way is that complexity creates overlapping and sometimes contradictory incentives. So the example that I think about is kind of, uh, so like risk-based capital, I'll, I'll talk about more in a second. But the risk-based capital, part of, part of the reason that the regulators want risk-based capital ratios is they say, we worry about the situation where uh, you might have banks that hold a little bit of very safe assets and a little bit of very risky assets, they, what they call the dumbbell balance sheet, where it's heavy on both ends and it's kind of thin in the middle, right? And they say, we want to prevent that and encourage banks to hold some more middle risk assets like regular real estate loans. Okay, maybe that's a good idea. But then banks are also subject to liquidity regulations. They're going to force them to hold more 
uh, low risk assets, but to make the same rate of return, they have to hold more high risk assets, right? So the liquidity re regulations create the dumbbell problem that the risk-based capital ratio is trying to avoid. And so you have these contradictory regulations that are pushing banks in different directions. What's gonna be the outcome of that? The banks are gonna have to do something different to kind of get around those regulations, and we don't know what that outcome is gonna be. The regulators don't know. They don't do any studies of how these over, over, uh, overlapping regulations are going to affect each other, so they, re they really don't know what the outcome is gonna be. And it can push banks to take even more risk to try to avoid those conflicting regulations. Uh, the third thing that I think about is that regulators just don't know all the riskiness of all the different assets. And it'd be nice if they knew all the, every, like every asset in the financial system, if they knew what the risk was, but they don't. But they act like they do, right? And so the, the, the main way that I think about that is the risk-based capital regulations, the risk-based capital ratio. So if you're not familiar with this, uh, what the Fed and the other regulators do is they look at all the different assets that the banks are holding, and they say, these are high risk, these are low risk, and they rate all the different types of assets. And then they assign the banks a capital ratio that the bank has to maintain based on the riskiness of those different assets. So high risk assets require that you maintain higher levels of capital, low risk assets, you can have lower levels of capital. Sounds like a good idea, right? Banks should have to hold more capital if they're um, having, high, having more risky assets. The problem is that, like I said, the regulators don't really know what's risky and what's not. And so that can cause problems because it can cause them, uh, when they misrate an asset, when they say that asset is really safe and it turns out to be risky, they're encouraging banks to actually take more risk. So the, the most common example of this is that prior to the financial crisis, the Federal Reserve and the other regulators were saying, mortgage-backed securities, those things are really safe. Banks should hold lots and lots of those. Right? I mean, maybe they weren't saying that. They maybe have said that, but they were, they were assigning the risk weights in such a way that mortgage-backed ba mortgage securities were among the safest assets, and so they were encouraging banks to hold more mortgage-backed securities. Obviously, that did not turn out well. You know, mortgage-backed securities were one of the major causes of the financial crisis, and at least to some degree, banks were holding those because the regulators were encouraging them to do that. And so I, I think that's a pretty well-known example, and some of the regulators will admit that that's the case. I think a lot of Republicans have pointed out that that's the case, but even some Democrats have pointed, out, pointed that out. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, just a few weeks ago, uh, in, in one of the Senate hearings said, quote, regulators treated dangerous mortgage-backed securities the same way they treated safe treasury bonds, she said. And the result was that taxpayers were left holding the bag when banks didn't have enough capital to withstand losses. And I think that's exactly right. And I think everyone's kind of come to realize that these complex regulations um, are actually creating risk because the Fed just can't know, they can't know the riskiness of every asset in the financial system. And so it's a mistake to think that they can because they might be encouraging risk. Now the Fed's response to that is, well, we need these risk weighting ratios, we need the risk-based capital ratio because it's a better predictor of bank risk than something like a simple re leverage ratio that treats all the, all the assets the same. Maybe, I mean, that's a testable hypothesis, right? On one hand, it might be that RBC ratios are better predictors of risk because we've rated all the assets, or it might be that they've misrated some of those assets and leverage ratios, a simple equity ratio is a better predictor of risk. So we can look at the real world and say, okay, which one of these things is a better predictor of risk? Turns out there are a lot of studies that do that, actually. It used to be in, say, the 1990s when the risk-based capital had first been introduced, there were a couple of studies that found that it was probably better, um, but that's changed a lot. There are several studies in the 2000s, and the big one that kind of changed the direction on this was um, Andrew Haldane, who's now the chief economist at the Bank of England, he gave a famous talk at the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Kansas City's annual conference in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and he presented evidence that for big international banks, the risk-based capital ratio was not a good predictor of risk, that the simple leverage ratio was a better predictor of the failure of international banks. That same study, same type of study was then later done by several different groups looking at U.S. banks, 
um, researchers from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, another group of researchers from NYU, including Nobel Prize winner Robert Engel. Um, I myself have done research on this, and so there are a, a lot of a lot of researchers. And I mean, you know, Nobel Prize winners, IMF, World Bank, and and not just great researchers, but publishing in the top journals in the fields of money and banking and monetary theory, all finding that simple leverage ratios are better predictors of risk than risk-based capital ratios. If you want those citations, they're in the paper. Um, so it seems like the risk-based capital ratio is all costs and no benefits, right? It's costly because it is creating risk in the financial system. It's no benefit because it actually doesn't do the thing the regulators are claiming of being a better predictor of risk. Uh, and so that seems weird. It seems like the risk-based capital ratio is a, is a pretty big problem that we would want to avoid. And so what does that mean for the, the current proposals? Well, Norbert talked about one proposal already um, that is the uh, stress buffer. And he talked about the problems of the complexity of, of it already. I mean, we're reducing the number of capital ratios from 24 to 14. So that's a big step, but 14 overlapping ratios is still a lot, right? So we're reducing the, cap the complexity a little bit, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, the estimates are that it will probably slightly increase capital requirements, which I would say is also a good thing, as, as Alex previously discussed. There are a lot of studies that look at the level of capital and say banks could be holding a lot more capital. It would probably be better for the financial system if they were holding 15 or 20 percent, and I think that's right. Like the title of my paper, Strong, Simple Regulations Promote Financial Stability. So the proposal of simplifying capital regulations um, and increasing capital levels a little bit, I think that's a win-win. There's another proposal right now that, that Norbert didn't discuss uh, that has been fairly controversial that is about the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio, the ESLR, and that proposal lowers the ESLR. So it's, you know, a lot of people have worried that that's a decrease in capital ratios. Uh, I don't know if that's maybe a big deal. I think maybe Diego is going to talk about that. Um, but I think, you know, we should probably be looking to raise rather than lower. But the big issue that I have with that is the intention of lowering the ESLR is because the regulators want to push more towards the risk-based capital ratio. They want to use the risk-based capital ratio more, which as I've already discussed, all the research says that's a bad idea. And so as one of the, they, they cite in their proposal a paper from the Federal Reserve Bank of, of New York from I think 2000, 2001, um, that finds that using, the, that using a leverage ratio and a risk-based capital ratio together is probably best. But that study actually doesn't look at that. It says maybe that would be a good idea. What it actually looks at is comparing the simple leverage ratio to the uh, risk-based capital ratio. And here's what it says, quote, the risk-weighted ratio does not consistently outperform the simple, simpler ratios, particularly with short horizons of less than two years. And in a short time horizon, risk weighting can overstate the differences in asset return variances and hence reduce the accuracy of the risk weighted ratio as a metal measure of capital adequacy. So even the paper that the Fed is citing is saying we should move more towards a risk-based capital ratio doesn't actually say that, right? And so it's, it's a bit of a mystery why they're pushing more towards that. Um, I think maybe they just haven't looked at the evidence. I, I, I'm hopeful that once, once they read more of the literature and realize there are a lot of studies saying that risk weighting is a bad idea, um, that maybe they'll change their minds. I mean, I think Jerome Powell and uh, Quarles are, are both you know, reasonable people that are interested in how regulation actually works in practice, not just how it works in economic theory. And so hopefully we'll, we'll see some more reforms from them along those lines. I think of the two proposals, you know, the one that, that Norbert discussed about uh, the stress buffer, that one's a good idea, but lowering the ESLR, I think, is a bad idea because it lowers the capital ratio and increases regulatory complexity. Those things are likely to actually increase risk in the financial system. Thank you, Thomas. And then last but not least, we have Diego. Thank you. Um, well, let me first of all say that I'm broadly in agreement with, with the uh, remarks that were just made, and I agree that uh, complexity in general makes it uh, more difficult to examine the state of the, the economy at any point in time and the banking system and so on. At the same time, having discussed that this is not a proposal for major change uh, on capital regulations, I do think that 
uh, the impact, if any deleterious impact indeed does happen, uh, is going to be fairly small. First of all, because uh, the estimates of the aggregate effect on capital holdings by the uh, banking, bank holding companies that are uh, subject to this new regime is very small. It's about 0.05, 0.04% according to the estimates from the uh, Federal Reserve uh, itself. And if we are worried about interconnections and the role that big banks have in contagion during times of financial stress, we should care about aggregate capital holdings as much as we do about individual bank holding company capital holdings. Um, the second item is that these are supplementary requirements. So they are a special regime that was created for large financial institutions that are perceived to be, uh, by reason of size or complexity of operations, or maybe both, uh, riskier and posing greater threat to the financial system and perhaps um, you know, creating some sort of um, um, moral hazard issue uh, if, by bank managers uh, in a context of deposit insurance that smaller institutions don't have. But they are supplementary, so that when we talk about leverage requirements versus risk-based capital requirements, we need to keep in mind that there is a minimum capital holding level for all financial institutions. If we're moving towards simpler requirements, uh, we want all financial institutions to hold them. Uh, I am against complexity, but I wouldn't say it is um, misguided to, if we identify larger financial institutions as posing greater risk, to try and adjust those additional capital holdings as to the actual risk that these financial institutions uh, are believed to hold. This is all in a context of skepticism about the proposals, but I think it is worth uh, speaking out for the regulators here, uh, although, you know, as someone coming from the Cato Institute, uh, that might come as a surprise. What I'm trying to do here is to try and do justice to the Federal Reserve proposals in the context of them being really quite modest, and I don't think they're going to be uh, either very beneficial or uh, deleterious, uh, except for the uh, simplification of the number of capital requirements that are in place. I do think that Randall Quarles does have uh, in mind uh, making the system somewhat more transparent, uh, and, and I think he's made it clear that he's concerned about regressive effects of regulation on institutions that legislation never aimed uh, to target in such an onerous way. I think that is to be welcomed, but again, uh, these proposals stand out for their modesty, if nothing else, and they're coming from a regulator, not, not a legislator, so uh, that also plays a role in that. Uh, that's the more specific uh, um, sort of analysis of the proposals. I would like to address the issue of uh, moving to simple leverage ratios, because I'm very favorable to it. Uh, but we should be careful about policy by heuristic. Heuristic being identifying a simple variable that we can target, and on that basis, uh, we set a simple target that everyone can understand, everyone can navigate, uh, and, and even you know, retail depositors could examine to try and judge the safety and soundness of an individual bank. That is all desirable, but the... It, the, 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 a heuristic is not something that is necessarily a causal driver of any kind of behavior. And so we find ourselves in a position where we might identify as a variable of interest something that has nothing to do with safety and soundness uh, over the long term. This it was a um, uh, th this is related to another uh, problem identified by Charles Goodhart, which, who you cited earlier, about 50%, which is Goodhart's law. The idea that if you, uh, the moment you target a particular variable, that beha the behavior of that variable that you identified previously will immediately change. Um, and that was partly the reason that risk-based capital requirements weren't a good predictor of failure in the previous crisis, is that financial institutions, knowing that this was the main focus of uh, regulatory uh, activity change their behavior to raise the rate of return as much as they could while still complying with the uh, existing risk weights. And because those were miscalibrated, um, of course, we, we ended up in a very bad situation. A regulator would answer, well, now we're calibrating them just fine. And we've identified that MBSs are actually much riskier than we initially thought they were. And so all is well. Uh, of course, one must be skeptical of that because uh, all the models of uh, um, uh, risk-based um, capital regulation are backward-looking, and uh, we have a very poor record of predicting the next financial crisis, and particularly the source of the next financial crisis. So those arguments should be taken with a grain of salt. But leverage ratios weren't subject to Goodhart's law in the same way in the previous crisis, and that might be the reason why they were, in fact, a good predictor uh, of bank failure. But the danger is we, we focus then on leverage, say, 
And then we find behavior changes precisely because of the tendency to engage in that sort of dumbbell balance sheet arrangement or something that uh, aims to comply with the letter of the law while doing what's in shareholders' interest, which you know banks will always uh, aim to do. And instances of policy failure as a result of that are myriad, particularly by central banks. So we had the Phillips curve in the 60s and 70s, which was this perceived relationship between unemployment and inflation that was targeted by central banks for a long time uh, until it was no longer in operation. Uh, and indeed, there's a big debate right now as to whether it is in operation today, given that unemployment is so low and inflation uh, still seems relatively uh, subdued. But another one, which is uh, very much um, a, a, a favorite topic of, of liberals, is Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall is a heuristic like any other. It's saying that investment banks are riskier and that deposit-taking institutions are safe and should be guaranteed by the government, and therefore we separate them neatly, the two of them, and we will do away with any risk-taking activity that's undue on the taxpayer's dime. Um, Andrew Haldane, in, that, in the paper you cited, mentions that as another simplification of the regime that might be desirable. I disagree. Alex Kupiak has written on this as well, saying that if you have structural separation of banks, all you'll have is a reallocation of assets between banks, and you won't deal with too big to fail. Um, I happen to agree with that. But the note of caution is about targeting new variables. We shouldn't, uh, you know, there's clearly a benefit in greater simplicity and in undoing the complexity of the current system, but we shouldn't fool ourselves that any individual variable will ever be a good forward predictor of uh, safety and soundness in the absence of market incentives to have safety and soundness. And I think historical analyses of leverage ratios sometimes fail to acknowledge that to the fullest extent, that you had a much more competitive and more market-based um, um, in some ways, at least, uh, you know, Steph Miller's in the audience, so I'm reluctant to say how market-based it was in the 19th century. But uh, um, it, it was in some ways more market-based and certainly more subject to failure than perhaps it is today. And that's, that's an issue to be considered. And then finally, just to briefly mention some of the broader issues that I find are highlighted by the Fed's proposals. Uh, the first one is that financial regulation seems to be turning more and more into industrial policy. If you read the document published by the Fed, it's all about the burden that regulation is causing on smaller financial institutions, even the smaller ones among the larger bank holding companies that it's supposed to be analyzing, and how that burden should be reduced, and the focus should be on the larger financial institutions. And that's something that Qualls has uh, mentioned as well, and it may well be the case, but it isn't strictly microprudential or credit cycle policy to do that. And there's a danger in trying to use regulation to address the problems created by other types of regulation. One of the reasons that regulation is so regressive today is because Know Your Customer and Anti-Money Laundering and uh, Bank Secrecy Act and call report disclosures pose a much greater burden on smaller banks than do on larger ones. But the answer is not to relax necessarily capital requirements on the smaller banks, it is to try and address those direct burdens from that particular legislation, especially when it doesn't deliver much bang for the buck. Um, but we seem to be using prudential relaxation as a way to address problems we identify elsewhere, and that I think is problematic. And then we have the perennial sort of post-crisis problem of capital formation and reduced lending, which is the reason that regulatory relief has come back on the agenda. It's not because there's been uh, I don't think any sort of free market spirit infused into regulatory agencies, but rather they are not able to fulfill their mission in the way that they are required to uh, in the present regulatory environment. And so they're trying to calibrate regulation in, in such a way as to better fulfill uh, that. And I, that, I suppose, is welcome. But we have to ask ourselves, where is this lending moving to? And where is capital formation moving to? And it's moving increasingly to the private sector, to the parts of uh, economic activity and, uh, and, and, and you know, capital supply that are subject to fewer requirements. And that, in the first place, excludes some people from access to lending and some people from access to capital returns. And in the second place, um, may raise issues of risk in, in areas that aren't currently being analyzed and that I think uh, poses an issue for regulators in the future. So that, those are the two broader issues I identify. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. I, make, I will make one really quick comment, and then we'll open it up to, to questions. Uh, my comment is that this whole system that we have now through Dodd-Frank, and I don't know really if the general public understands this, um, the, the whole thing is built on not letting banks fail. And when I say banks, I mean banks as we know them, 
the operating companies underneath the holding company structure, not letting them fail, not necessarily buffering them with more, uh, although there are more liquidity restrictions and there are more capital restrictions and higher requirements, not necessarily putting all the capital or liquidity that we would need for them to fail, to keep them from failing there, but then putting it somewhere else, putting it at the holding company level and literally telling them that we're doing this so that if there is a problem, those operating companies can stay open. I think that's a recipe for disaster. That's my comment. Uh, and, and I don't, and, and in terms of fooling ourselves, you know, in terms of this, these stress tests, we know that these things are wild guesses. I mean, we, we can look back, we know that this happened with regions in the crisis. Regions said, so this is actually two comments. Uh, regions told their, their own investors, uh, own equity holders, that we think we're gonna lose, we might, we wanna prepare ourselves to lose up to $3.4 billion over the next two years. The Fed came in with their stress testing and said, we want you to raise enough capital to withstand $9 billion in losses. Turns out they only lost $2 billion. And in the next four-year period, they had a $4 billion profit. I'm not really sure what the heck we're doing here. You know, I mean, this is, this is beyond complex. And the, the whole idea to me seems to be completely turned on its head as, as compared to what it should be. Uh, which should be to keep those institutions that are actually operating safer and sounder, as opposed to doing these other sort of like bells and whistles. Um, and somehow that's supposed to be better. I don't think it is. Maybe that was three comments. I don't know. And can I give a quick response? Go ahead. Um, so uh, uh, to comment on Diego's comments, so I, I mean, I agree with a lot of the things that you said, but I want to point out something that I'm not sure is – is correct. So I think we would agree that if there are if there are macro targets or if there are market-based targets or something like that, that then they might be able to be manipulated. Uh, if we were going to talk about looking at a bank's stock price or stock options or something, that's something they can get in the market and manipulate. But a capital ratio is not necessarily a heuristic, right? A heuristic means this is sort of a rough estimate of what they've got, and a capital ratio is actually the amount of equity that they've got. And so it might be that that fundamental uh, measure, it's not just a heuristic. It might be something that is more effective than a heuristic. I would say the RBC ratio is more of a heuristic than the capital ratio, which is something fundamental. Now, you might be right that it, it could be the case that um, prior to the introduction of risk-based capital ratios that, that started in 91, so we could look back at the 80s and say, um, maybe when we were using the leverage ratio rather than the RBC ratio, banks were able to avoid that. And I don't know for sure about the 80s, but I know that there are papers that look at the Great Depression and find that the capital ratios are predictors of, of failure. So it's not like the capital ratio, it's not like banks were always able to avoid this. Um, they there are no studies that I know of that would go back to like the Great Depression and estimate what the RBC ratios would have be, been at that time. That would be super interesting if anyone wants to do that. I'm not sure if there's enough data available. Um, but something like that would give us a, a, uh, an, a sort of out-of-sample analysis of um, when we had a different actual measure being used, which one was more effective. Um, and, and so I'm not, so, so we don't have evidence for sure that that's the case, but we do have evidence that Prior to the introduction of RBC ratios, capital ratios were a good predictor of risk, not just a heuristic. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I, I support some sort of leverage ratio as, as, as a better measure than what's currently in place. All I'm the issue I'm raising is that when you try and operationalize that as a regulatory measure, you have to choose what the threshold is that is acceptable. And then secondly, um, you have to, um, the, you know, I mean, you, what was the, sorry, I, I, I lost my train of thought there momentarily. Uh, I'll come back to that. Okay, I was going to cut you off anyway. <laughs> sorry. <Great. laughs> if, we, uh, if we do have any questions in the audience, I did want to leave a couple of minutes to do that. So if anybody has any questions, uh, we do have Jonathan with a microphone. And if you could just state your name and affiliation and then ask a question, if we have any. Do we have, we have one back here? Yeah. I'm Eric Rizzo. I'm with uh, Mizuho Bank, a Tokyo-based bank, uh, obviously with U.S. operations. want to ask anybody who wants to answer this, how is what's happening today in Congress with the Crapo Bill? How will this play into 
what you guys are discussing and maybe the broader regulatory uh, discussion over the next several months, whatever it may be. That's great. I So the Fed's going to do this particular rule no matter what. Um, so, so, th so that's happening. And I, I can't, um, I'm, I'm thinking through the, the major provisions. I don't think that it has, I don't think that it will have much of an interaction sort of effect on, on this rule going forward, although I could be missing something, but most of the, um, most of the relief is for the is for ten billion and below. You have this this SIFI threshold thing, uh, but it doesn't really raise the SIFI threshold. It, I mean, it raises it, but it doesn't really raise it. But, but an important part of that bill is the, the supplementary issue. leverage ratio. An important part of that bill is the issue that we're discussing about um, complexity, right? Well, they they want to allow the exemption where if you're if you're a small bank and you have a high enough capital ratio, then you should be able to. Not uh, not be required to comply with all the super complex regulations, right? And so, in that sense, it is kind of the same thing, and it is sort of an acknowledgement that we've sort of gone too far in the complexity here, and need to get back to something simple. Now, the reason that that's really being done in that bill is not because of risk; it's it's because of the costs involved for small banks that the complexity is just too much for them. But I think it has the added benefit of. Um, not giving banks the bad incentives to to take more risk, and so in that sense, it is kind of the the same issue, um, and, as, as Alex had previously go ahead, sorry. discussed. Go ahead. Uh, the regulatory reform for small banks will not help your bank, not being a small bank. <laughs> the uh, uh, I think the the bill they're going to pass is a modest reform, which ought to be done. Uh, it also has an amazing variety of constituency favors uh, built into it, a very long list. It's a, uh, yeah. it's a wonderful example of how legislation actually works. Um, I want to make one a broader comment, if I can, before we get another question. Some philosopher, it might have been Whitehead, said, seek simplicity and distrust it. And a good reason to distrust it are these feedback these feedback effects that you do, once you pick something as what you're going to manipulate, you don't know what that will cause. But it's equally true that you should try complexity and distrust it. Um, you should have a central bank and distrust it. You need to have a government and distrust it. And you also need to distrust all private actors uh, because until men are angels, uh, we won't get perfect outcomes. And that means that we should expect Failure. So a system built on, uh, this is what I wanted to, yeah. to get to, Norbert, a system built on trying to prevent failure is the wrong objective. Yeah. Uh, we should have, if, if we're having, if we have a market, if we're going to have advance, you have to have failures along the way, and it's, it's how to build the system that allows that uh, uh, to happen, but doesn't run away into, uh, into, into systemic uh, crises. That's the, that's the issue. I'll, I'll add one more piece to that, too. The leverage ratio that they've put in this bill that's going to become law, um, I mean, they borrowed from the Choice Act concept of having an off-ramp, which is, I think, a great idea. The Choice Act was a very broad off-ramp, which was, and it was great, and, and it was, uh, it, it would it would relieve you from all sorts of regulations. The, the off-ramp that's in this bill is not that. Um, the off-ramp that's in this bill is not very broad. And it also has a lot of regulatory discretion. The regulators can come in and say, well, we see your risk profile. We don't like your risk profile. So even though you met the leverage ratio, you're not getting out of anything. I mean, that's, I like that it's in law. I like that it will be in law. And then hopefully uh, that will be easier to improve going forward. Uh, but, you know, it, there's, there's still some complexity in there. And part of that complexity is whatever this risk profile is, and the Fed comes in and looks at the risk profile, which is sort of like a Volcker thing, but it's, it's, it, could be, it could be much better. Uh, that's, that's my two cents. Norbert and I testified together on the Choice Act, actually sitting in exactly the same that's right, that's right. relationship to each other. And on this side of me uh, was a representative of the big banks, and he said, we don't like this 10% choice. We don't like this so-called off-ramp. We like it with risk-based capital we, uh, he didn't say complexities, but with risk-based <laughs> capital complexities, uh, to, to which Chairman Henserling replied, well, we're not saying you have to do it. If that's what you like, you choose, you choose to stay with that. 
uh, which I thought was a pretty good response. However, it points out something important, which is that all complex systems generate constituencies for, their, for themselves and for maintaining the complexity. So if you have a very complex capital system within the, within the central bank, there now creates a huge internal consistency of people whose jobs are all operating, operating this system. Within the big banks in particular, there come to be huge internal constituencies devoted to operating these systems uh, within the um, uh, all, all of the regulatory bodies, not only the central bank, you get the same effect. Within academia, you get people who get to publish a lot of papers and, and give speeches and things operating on this complexity. They get a huge consulting uh, business uh, build up in the in the accounting firms and uh, and other consultants uh, in order to use this. So there comes to be a big constituency devoted, which benefits greatly from the existence of the complex system, and and that makes it hard to change. It's one of the reasons why once you have these things, it's it's hard, in fact, ever to simplify them. Well, and the and the other thing is that complexity, if history is any guide does come back, even when you try and simplify. So even if we move to a capital ratio, which I think all of us on this panel would favor, uh, how long would it take until someone raised the issue that a new instrument actually didn't fit, that the previous capital ratio model was designed for a simpler world in which things were easy to look at, and now we needed uh, new forms, more accurate, more forward-looking, which is a favorite term uh, in the Fed, uh, measures of risk that needed to be uh, used, especially for the larger banks, because we like the small guys better than we like the... Uh, <laughs> The, the big guys, and sometimes that's for good reason, but not uh, always. The other thing I wanted to raise earlier was the impact on lending. So if you, if you have a capital ratio of any level, and there's dispute in the literature as to how much impact it would have, uh, any, any sort of capital ratio might have on, on, on credit extension. Do you have anybody else with a question? Are we good? So actually, can I just respond to that quickly? So I think, I actually think that the, um, so, I mean, that is what the Fed's saying about reducing the ESLR, right? As they said, that, well, since the financial crisis, we've increased capital levels and we've seen this decline in lending. And there are a couple of recent studies that say, yep, lending went down and capital went up, and therefore it must be that we constrained capital and banks reduced lending. Um, but I think that those studies actually don't do a very good job of accounting for the changes in regulation since the financial crisis. Yes, we increased capital levels, but we also put specific restrictions on mortgage lending. And so if we're saying, why did lending go down? Well, part of it might have been capital requirements, but we know for sure that at least part of it was due to increased regulation on lending. And so I think the current studies don't do a good job of that, as, as I briefly mentioned. And um, again, there are a couple citations in the paper, but there's, you know, there's a literature that looks more broadly at what what is the effect, um, what's the net effect of raising capital? And the, the thing, the trade-off that they look at in terms of cost benefit is, let's assume that when we raise capital that there's some kind of decrease in bank lending, but there's also a decrease in bank failures and financial crises. What's the appropriate level that where we should be setting capital um, in order to uh, have the optimal trade-off? And they usually find that it's something higher, like 15 to 20 percent or even more than 20 percent. Right, so um, so I think that the the even though the Fed is saying we're going to reduce capital levels and that's going to increase lending, it's not clear from the recent literature that that's the case, and it's not clear that that's going to be the best benefit overall for the economy. In all the Basel stuff, I mean, like I'll I'll take prerogative here, but I, we have one of the best audiences that I've ever had for something like this, and no questions, but it's a big audience. This is great. Um, so I will I will go on uh, a soapbox here. Um, the the Basel rules. If you go back and look at the history of that, you'll hear Janet Yellen, or or you might have heard Janet Yellen testify about how well we know that the banks with the flat ratio they were just taking high risk. That's not true. There that's that's not what happened with the Basel implementation. That was under Paul Volcker. That was in response to in response to an international crisis. They went out and tried to get this, this system that everybody could agree on for capital requirements to harmonize those in, for those internationally active banks. And I mean, just look at the risk weighting. I mean, what does it do? It lowers effective capital. 
So those guys were on board with that. So they got it down to a lower level of capital that they could all agree to through the risk weights, which, I mean, okay, fine, that's fine. Then they implemented it and said, okay, we're going to make all the banks do this. It was never intended to be like that. But everybody saw that you could actually lower the effective amount of capital you were funding yourselves with if you did something like that. So everybody was on board with it. I mean, let's not kid ourselves about what we've done here. Unlike uh, some of our colleagues here today, I can remember when the first <laughs> puzzle, uh, actually a good friend of mine was one of, was one of the staffers on it. And uh, I think one of the biggest reasons for the first Basel agreement was to try to control the Japanese banks. It, uh, who are our colleague. It was basically a, a plan cooked up between the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England to control the Japanese banks, just as an interesting historical note. Uh, could I make one other comment? Because, uh, uh, Norbert, you talked about, uh, about the, the capital uh, leakage out of the banks, which the Fed is concerned with. And here, I think, um, maybe also to give the Fed its due, they're worried about something historical, which is in the run-up uh, to the crisis and panic of 2007, 2009, there were huge capital liquidations by major financial firms. Uh, mostly, I'm talking about stock buybacks uh, as, you, as you came up to the crisis. And this the Fed talks about in their, in their proposal, and it's a fair point to make, I think. You look at the behavior, the behavior was very large stock buybacks uh, in pursuit of uh, stockholder uh, of value, liquidating capital just about the time the capital was needed. I've, I've always wanted, and I have never done it, to, uh, to add up the total stock buybacks done by the whole financial system compared to the size of the TARP investments that were actually made in banks. I'll bet they're, I'll bet they're similar. I bet they are. So the dividend payments by themselves were close to half. Yeah. So they're, they're probably, they might yeah, surpass. They, they might. Dividend. Anyway, it's something. So that we know this is on, on the Fed's mind. And, and that's, a fair, that's a fair thing to worry about. If you look further into why that happened, it's because uh, in a boom or in a, in a bubble, there's a lot of what turns out to be illusory capital. It's profits that you're measuring and you're reporting and you think you're making that's generating capital that you think you have. But in fact, all of the profits are a result of the bubble itself. And and our, and of the especially in a mark to market world yeah. of the right of the of the uh, things that look like profits that turn out to be not so uh, this is a place where I think you you have to give the Fed its due to to think about how this acts and if you if you are in a bubble situation uh, how how you react to liquidation of capital in particular through big uh, stock. Buybacks, and that is where the countercyclical elements really come into play. How do you, how do you have a uh, a program of capital regulation which is in fact countercyclical in its effects instead of procyclical, which is usually how it how it turns out to actually to be? I don't think we've solved uh, we, we've solved that one yet. Thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate it.